Thank you so much. This is such a pleasure. I'm positive I have never been introduced as Jana fucking Levin before. <laughs> and I love it. That's my new requirement. Anytime I take a speaking engagement, I'm going to put that in the country. It's so lovely to travel and to be here. And I, I thank you so much for having me. I was supposed to come here about two years ago, right before the pandemic hit. And... Um, and it's really, it's really great, great to be here. I am going to talk to you about black holes, as promised. And um, I wanted to start with kind of a tour of the universe. What I'm going to show you right now is not a cartoon. And I'll notify you anytime something is real observation or an artist's impression. And this is uh, an atlas of real observations of our own galaxy the Milky Way. This is where we all live. I think I live in New York City, you think you live in Copenhagen, but this is really where we live, right? And we live in the galactic suburbs of this spectacular galaxy. So the scientists have mapped the universe and mapped this galaxy as well as they can and have placed it as accurately as possible. And we're gonna take a little tour inside it, but what you have to realize is we've never been able to get out of our galaxy. This is a collection of some hundreds of billions of stars, 300, billion stars or so. If you've ever had the privilege of seeing the Milky Way in the dark sky, it looks like a riff across the sky because we're in the plane of the galaxy. And here we are coming to our star, which is like a pretty ordinary star in the cosmos. I love it, you love it. <laughs> it's great. And here we are, we're the third rock from the sun, and we've made all of these observations without leaving our galaxy. Right, and that's really stunning. The furthest object that has been made by human beings, um, that the, the furthest from the Earth is, is one of the Voyager missions, which, which only broke out of the solar influence recently. So we've only had basically one object go out of the solar system. And we've done all of this from this blue rock, and that's really quite spectacular when you think about it. A um, 100 years ago, it's 2021, we're just on the cusp of Hubble realizing there are other galaxies. Before that, post-Einstein, uh, we did not know if the Milky Way was the entire universe, okay? So you think of the some 300 billion stars in the universe, and this is a map of just observations of other galaxies. This is real data. These are real galaxies. There are as many galaxies in the observable universe as there are stars in the Milky Way. So every one of these galaxies has hundreds of billions of stars. And if you think about 1% of them become black holes, we're talking about hundreds of billions of black holes in the universe none of which we can see really, and we'll talk about it, we've only ever seen one black hole. And I know that comes as a surprise to people because uh, when there was a recent observation, very recent, which we'll talk about, where we saw our first picture of a black hole ever. And, um, and yet they're plentiful in the cosmos. Not only are there hundreds of billions of black holes in the hundreds of billions of galaxies, but each one of these probably very, very likely harbors a supermassive black hole in its center. So black holes are the cores of every one of our galaxies. We have a black hole in the center of our galaxy. It's about 26,000 light years away, which is very close. <laughs> Almost as close as Copenhagen in New York. <laughs> and it's more than four million times the mass of the sun. Oh, we don't want to see credits. We don't want to give credit to scientists. That's okay. They're used to not being credited. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. You can look that up online. They're awesome. This, look, this is the beauty of science. That's a totally international collaboration. And it's absolutely free to use and the data, to see the data. And it's required that the data is shared. That's an absolutely beautiful aspect of what scientists have chosen to do you know, internationally. So here we have a supermassive black hole. It's 26,000 light years away. We call it Sagittarius A star because it's in the direction of the constellation Sagittarius from where we sit in the universe. And, um, and we are in orbit around that black hole. That black hole is every bit as much 
the center of our cosmic experience as the sun is the center of our solar experience. We orbit the sun and our entire solar system together orbits that black hole at the center of our galaxy. We're moving at 220 kilometers per second around that black hole. Now, this is an unusual black hole picture, I admit. So this is, um, I don't know if people have seen this video, but I wanted to try to do curved space time in two slides, uh, maybe three. So, um, so to understand black holes, we have to understand curved space time. They're a completely curved space time phenomenon. And, um, and I'm gonna try to convince you that black holes are not objects, but they're like places. And to begin to consider how a black hole might be a place and not a thing, we have to think about what a place really means. And in the scheme of cosmology, um, we begin to consider places as space times. And that is a very challenging concept. It, it took Einstein 11 years from the time he proposed relativity to really understand curved space time in its full expression. And I used to think that was a really long time. <laughs> now I no longer think like devoting 11 years to something sounds like that long, but um, he famously made many mistakes and somebody once pulled him aside and was like, Einstein, your name is gonna be on this paper. You can't submit this paper. And he was like, oh, my name is on plenty of wrong papers. <laughs> like, um, he was unafraid of being wrong, which was part of why he was so daring. And it's something I think we, we miss a little bit. But the other thing Einstein taught us was the thought experiment, uh, the imagining. And here's a beautiful experiment. He's trying to understand what gravity is. Right now, it's more relevant, it's relevant to all of us because we're not on the ground floor of the building. Right now you feel heavy in your seats and you think that's gravity. You up there in the balconies, you feel heavy in your seats and you think that's gravity. Einstein thought, what does the balcony and the seat have to do with gravity? Why don't I just remove those? So what if I remove the seats and I remove the balcony, you fall and you fall freely. And in the moments when you're falling freely, you experience weightlessness. You don't feel heavy. You don't feel heavy at all. In fact, if you were in an elevator and the cable was cut and you fell, you would actually feel like an astronaut in the International Space Station. You could pour water in front of you and it would fall at the same rate and it would look like it was falling with you. And he called this the happy, it's so simple, and he called it the happiest thought of his life. Falling freely without any interruption is an experience of weightlessness. That's the first observation. I'm gonna show you this video by the band OK Go. How many people have seen this? Okay, they are in a plane, they are not in outer space. What's about to happen is the plane is gonna nosedive. So they are experiencing complete free fall. They are, again, not in outer space, they are literally, there's no CGI effects. They are in a plane that is falling. And they might as well be an astronaut in the ISS. They experience complete weightlessness and they can do everything the astronauts do. And uh, the unhappy ending will be if the plane hits the ground. But that's the fault of atoms. That's not the fault of gravity. So they did this flight, apparently there was an ex enormous amount of sick on the flight. They did it some 50 times, but they only did this video's one single shot of those 50 times. Um, I'm sure they were just green by the end of it. Okay, I'm gonna stop it, but it's fantastic. It's a fantastic video. I, I love this demonstration of weightlessness. So I wanna emphasize the astronauts in the International Space Station are not far away from the Earth. They are not experiencing no gravity. They are absolutely experiencing gravity. They are in the same situation as these people in the plane. They're falling, but they're falling in such a way that they never crash into the earth. They just keep clearing the horizon, okay? Um, if you stopped the ISS, it would drop like a stone right to the earth. The second observation that goes into understanding curved space-time is that if I throw something and I allow it to fall freely, 
it does not travel in a straight line. It follows a curve. And these two simple observations are what lead us intuitively to understand that what you're doing when you throw something, oh, and this is, by the way, artist Leah Halloran, who did all the illustrations um, for, for the, the Black Hole Survival Guide that we just published together. Um, something like 25 original artworks, it's really quite beautiful, it makes it very special for me that she did that. And um, you can actually map the shape of space-time by watching the paths things follow in space, that they don't travel straight lines. So I could, I could think of it in this way, that if I have something like the sun, it creates a curvature in space-time, and when things are falling weightlessly and freely in that space-time, they don't travel on straight lines, and the paths that they follow are curved paths. And this is true even for the sun. And if you didn't follow all of that explanation, that's the most technical I'm gonna get in the whole conversation, but it was fun just to show the OK Go video. It was worth it just for that. Here is a technical diagram of a black hole. What does a black hole do? It is the most concentrated version of a curved space-time, really, that we know of. And it's so strong, the curves in space-time, that even light, you can notice, does not travel in a straight path. It starts to loop around the black hole. And we'll talk about how that influences things. That is a pretty accurate picture of a black hole. <laughs> and this is why they're very hard to observe. They are technically dark against a dark sky. And so what we really need, it's literally like looking for a shadow. Looking for the shadow of a tree at midnight is a useless endeavor. You want to see illuminated to see the shadow cast. And we'll talk about a, how a black hole is just a shadow. Um, this is another um, artist's rendering from my friend Leah. If the space-time was helpfully painted, we could see the curves on it, but it is not. And so, in fact, if you were to fall around a black hole, this is more or less what you would be looking at. <laughs> and, um, and in fact, crossing the black hole would be kind of unspectacular. This is not a cartoon or an artist's image. This is a mathematical model by the physicist Andrew Hamilton. And what he's done is said, pretend that the Earth became a black hole. Uh, sorry, the sun. Um, if the Earth became a black hole, it'd be teeny, 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 tiny. The sun became a black hole. So right now, the sun is a million and a half kilometers across. If the sun were to become a black hole, it would be six kilometers across. I ordinarily say things like it would fit in Central Park, but maybe you can give me the Copenhagen equivalent. It would fit in Copenhagen. A mere six kilometers across. But think about how staggering that is. Six kilometers across. If the Earth were to orbit a dead sun that had become a black hole, the orbit would be fine. If the sun turned into a black hole tomorrow, the orbit would be fine. That, this idea that black holes tear everything in and suck things up like a vacuum is utterly false. We're at such a safe distance, nothing would be wrong. It would be cataclysmically, you know, dark. It'd be really cold. No more global warming and that kind of stuff would be over. Um, but notice that in this model, uh, Andrew Hamilton has put the Earth really close, really, really close to the sun. It's like 10 kilometers outside the sun or something on that order of magnitude, and it's still safe. It can orbit safely. When the Earth looks distorted in this image, it's because the light is taking a weird path, not because the Earth is changing shape. So you can actually safely orbit. If you're an explorer, so the last book was Black Hole Survival Guide. If you want to go explore a black hole and you want to survive, plant yourself 10 kilometers outside the black hole. That's OK. But just put yourself in a really safe orbit, like the ISS. You'll be in free fall. But you can just watch everything, you know, unfold from that safe distance. You will not be sucked in. Um, now, when black holes were first discovered, it was really a mathematical idea. So Einstein, in 1916, publishes finally this remarkable uh, mathematical model of how space-time curves around mass and energy. It's not just stars. It's not just the Earth. I'm curving space-time, right? It's just, gravity is extremely weak. I know we all think it's strong, but gravity is incredibly weak. My little muscles can fight the whole Earth 
right now. That's remarkable. Things like there are many forces that are, that are well, there's one in particular that's much stronger that dominates our lives, with, which is electromagnetism. But gravity is actually incredibly weak. We don't notice the curves in space until we have intense masses, like suns, moons, planets. Um, so Einstein writes down this model of how intense masses will curve space and time. And his friend writes him from the Russian front. It's World War I. And he's a German soldier. He's enlisted um, uh, in the army. He's a Jewish astronomer um, who's already pretty accomplished. And he goes to the front. And between calculating ballistic trajectories, you know, and enduring the war, He's reading the proceedings of the Prussian Academy of Sciences, you know, as you do. And he's really impressed with Einstein's new theory. And within six months, he writes down this beautiful mathematical model of the black hole. It's not called a black hole. He doesn't know if it's real. All he says is, imagine, and again, it's this beautiful thought experiment. Imagine all the mass of a star crushed to a point. He doesn't say how this could happen or if it's possible, just as imagine it. And then he writes down the mathematics of the description and what comes out is in specific in that curved space time, a region where not even light can escape. It's what we call the event horizon and that is the shadow of the black hole. So when we describe when I say, oh, if the sun was a black hole, it would be six kilometers across, what I really mean is the shadow cast would be six kilometers across. There's actually nothing there. There's nothing there at all. And uh, Einstein's very impressed with the mathematics and he helps get it published. Unfortunately, Schwarzschild dies within six months from an infection he contracts on the front. It's not called a black hole for, for decades, five decades. Um, Einstein actually thinks this is great math, but it's not real. Nature will protect us from their formation. It's not really until people like Oppenheimer and people who are struggling with nuclear weapons during World War II begin to understand the nuclear physics enough and think, oh wow, nature has found a way to make a black hole, and that is by killing off some really heavy stars. And it's a surprise, and it was debated. So the idea was that the mass of this, the, when the star runs out of thermonuclear fuel, it's the same process that goes into making the bombs that they were building and the bombs that they were uh, trying to theorize about. And uh, that nuclear force is going on, that's what keeps the sun bright. And when it runs out of thermonuclear fuel, it begins to collapse under its own weight. And um, Oppenheimer and Schneider, his student, theorized that the mass of the star, if it was heavy enough, would overcome the nuclear pressure and create a black hole. They published this paper, it's 1939. By the way, this is another black hole. <laughs> Have any of you tried the cocktail? I'm saving it for after. Okay. Um, so they, theor they write, published this paper in 1939. It's the same day that the um, Nazis advance on Poland and the paper is very much lost in oblivion. Nobody talks about this paper for 20 years. Um, it's, it's many, many years later that people start to think, oh, maybe stars actually form black holes. Um, they don't get a name until 1967 when allegedly John Wheeler, the famous uh, um, American astronomer, um, a uh, physicist is tired of saying catastrophic gravitational collapse and somebody from the back hall, much as this, maybe one of you will be able to coin a term tonight, shouts, how about black hole? And that was it. Um, that was in 1967. So here's another mathematical model. So this is what it would look like if we were to try to fall into a black hole. So you're an astronomer, you've not been paying attention to your astronomy class, and you're like, what's this? And so you're orbiting and you're, this is what you're seeing now is the light swirling around the black hole. When you, the star collapses, it creates a curved space time around it. It leaves behind the event horizon like a shadow, 
like an archaeological remnant in the shape of the space-time, but then the star itself continues to fall. And it continues to fall. It can no more sit at the event horizon than it can race outward at the speed of light. And so that star and the light it emits continues to fall, and it falls inward and inward and inward. It was only one year ago this month that Roger Penrose won the Nobel Prize for realizing this work, that the star leaves behind nothing. The star is gone. Of that, we're sure, okay? I can't tell you what happens inside a black hole. I don't know, maybe something called a singularity forms, which is a region of such strong space-time curvature, we call it infinite, where stuff ceases to exist. Maybe it blows out into a new universe. Maybe the black hole's six kilometers on the outside, but it's as big as a universe on the inside. All of that's conceivable. I don't know, but I do feel confident telling you that the black hole leaves nothing at the event horizon. So when I say there's a black hole astrophysically, I mean there's a place where it's empty space-time. I don't mean that there's a thing. So let's look at this beautiful model again. Um, it's a very accurate physical model, and what I want you to appreciate is you don't notice when you've crossed the event horizon. Here you are, you're an astronaut, and you're falling around this empty region of space. It's that dark, nothing is emitted. That's all you know. Right now, right about now, you're inside the black hole. You've not come up to a rock or a surface or a dense object, there's nothing there. Notice also, it's not dark on the inside. So black holes can be bright on the inside, even if they're by definition, dark on the outside. Why can they be bright on the outside? Because the light from the galaxy can fall in behind you. You can watch the evolution of the entire galaxy, the Earth, you can find out what happens in the next election, you know, climate change. Uh, you can find out when civilizations come and go, you can find out how the galaxy evolves, because all of that light can rain down on you, and you can watch it before you are crushed to death in the center of the black hole. I can't tell anybody what happens, though. Um, this idea of, of the light coming in behind you is actually quite interesting because when all the light gets concentrated as you're falling towards the center of the black hole, you can survive the transition across the event horizon, no problem. But as you get closer and closer to the center, you will definitely be crushed to death because the space-time curves are so strong that you're being pushed together, you're being elongated, your muscles will rip. Sometimes people call it spaghettification. That's really my friend Neil deGrasse Tyson's fault. I will not forgive him for that. It's a terrible term. You will be spaghettified, nonetheless, I'm gonna use it. Um, and until you're ripped apart to your fundamental particles, and that's it. There is no, uh, I, I, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel, I'm repeating myself a little bit here, but I say it's like a near-death experience where you see a bright flash of light, but it's like a total death experience. <laughs> um, so what's inside a black hole, we don't know. In some respects, we're not that interested anymore, the proverbial we, you know, physicists are not overwhelmingly interested with what's inside a black hole. We're mostly interested with what is outside a black hole. And um, because that we believe is real. Why do we think black holes are real? Einstein thought nature would protect us from our formation. Even if Oppenheimer and everyone shows us that they're gonna form, about 1% of the stars are gonna die and become black holes, they're dead stars. They're teeny, teeny, tiny. They're teeny, teeny, tiny. So even if a black hole is 30 or 50 times the mass of the sun, it's less than a couple hundred kilometers across and they're thousands of light years away. How would you possibly see such a thing? So it was sort of, for a while, there were ideas, well, maybe they'll, uh, as black holes move through the galaxy, um, they'll twinkle the light behind them because it's bending the space-time and the path of the light will bend, it'll twinkle. People tried to look for that. It's very, very hard to look for that, and so, um, Really, for a long time, black holes have kind of like fell out of favor again. And then there were these observations. This is my only, what I call, um, uh, like, artist's interpretation. Um, 
this is not a real observation. We, could, we have never come anywhere close to being able to resolve the details of something like this. But what happened is people observed a big star somewhere in the universe that looked like it was kind of getting torn apart, like cotton candy, like tufts of it were being pulled off. And um, the theory was that they're gonna fall around this black hole, they're gonna create this swirling disk around the black hole, and that black hole's gonna make jets. And there were observations that really supported that. Um, and then the observations got stronger and stronger, so they're all indirect. They're way too hard to observe. I want to impress upon you that black holes are heavy, but they're small for their heft. And what we see, this is a real observation from the Hubble Space Telescope, where we see incredible jets coming out of an entire galaxy. And these jets are believed to be uh, generated and powered by black holes. So there's this irony that the darkest phenomena in the universe becomes the brightest beacon in the universe. And they really are the brightest beacons in the universe. Those jets are, um, in some cases, millions of light years across. They can blow into other galaxies. They could destroy planets and other sentient life forming in other galaxies. They're that powerful. These are the kinds of, um, what, are, what, are they, what are they called now? Um, existential events. We don't want to get blasted by a black hole jet in the Milky Way. So we've indirectly observed black holes since the 60s and 70s, and, and it became very common by the 80s and 90s to be, believe that black holes were real. But we had never seen one, and we had never directly observed one. And I think that's a real surprise to people, um, even who kind of followed this stuff. So the, the next big step was to realize, well, even though black holes are tiny and they're hard to see, if I have two black holes and they're in orbit around each other, the way that they create curves in the space-time, they will also force those curves to follow them, which you should now think of fish swirling in a pond. They will create waves in the shape of space-time. Literally, if I was around two black holes that were orbiting each other, I would kind of, my path would bob up and down. Right? Even if I was falling freely and weightlessly. We call these gravitational waves. They were theorized many years ago. It was debated for ages whether or not they were real. These crazy people who I love, who now have Nobel Prizes, <laughs> went after them 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And um, in a very unpopular experiment known as LIGO, which some of you may have heard of, again, an international um, collaboration, to try to measure the ringing in the shape of space-time. So if space-time can curve, it can, the curves themselves can wave. And I liken this to like a musical instrument. If I pluck an electric guitar, it really doesn't sound like anything, but if I plug it into an amplifier, I hear the electric guitar. In this case, the amplifier are these gigantic instruments they built to try to record the ringing of space-time. It's like the black holes are mallets on the drum of space-time. Space-time rings, and they try to record it. They built an instrument um, that in, in the year 2000, after, uh, it was about 50 years by 2000. So these were young people who spent 50 years of their lives, then in the year 2000, build the first instrument. It operates for 15 years. They're trying to make the first direct detection of black holes. This is not light. This is pure space-time. They're trying to record two empty places in space-time, moving like mallets on a drum, creating ringing in the shape of space-time. No light whatsoever, no telescopes. And it was extremely unpopular, and it cost a lot of money. And they heard nothing. <laughs> crickets, crickets. In 2015, they've gotten to the point where they're building the advanced instrument. They weren't that surprised that they heard nothing. Still pretty nervy, you know what I'm saying? So Ray Weiss, who was the original architect on the instrument, said to me in 2015, August, I think, um, if we don't detect black holes, this thing is a failure. He's in his 80s at that time. 
And um, what he's really saying is, I'm a failure. And so it's why I called that book, I was writing a book at the time, which is why we were talking so much, um, and so I called it Black Hole Blues, like, because I was, I was done with the book and they could have failed. Um, it comes to September and they, um, they're not that confident in the instrument. They've got now $3 billion on the line. It's now bloomed to a collaboration of about 1,000 people, which is really not that big, um, internationally. Uh, and uh, and they're, they're frustrated, so they cancel the science run. They're about to do a science run, and they cancel it. And they're interrupting the instrument. They're banging on it. They're driving trucks into it. I mean, they're doing anything they can just to kind of test the instrument's response, it doesn't matter the details of the instrument. Um, but basically think of it as a recording device, an antenna, to try to record the ringing of the drum of space-time. About one in the morning, there's one instrument that was built that's in Louisiana. These instruments are huge. They're four kilometers long. They take up a lot of space. They have to be in the middle of nowhere. There's one in Louisiana. There's another one in Washington State on the other side of the continental US. Um, now there's one in Japan. There's one in Italy. But those were still under development, and there were only these two machines. And um, the experimentalists become exhausted. It's like one in the morning in Louisiana, they decide to put their instruments down and go home. Same thing about the same time happens in Washington State. And, um, and within an hour, actually I'm gonna stop this, within an hour of uh, them driving off to their remote, shabby, trust me, apartments that are provided by the National Science Foundation, um, something's recorded at the instrument in Louisiana. And it scoots across the continental US at the speed of light, which is what we expect, and it's recorded in Washington state. By the time Ray Weiss wakes up at 8.30 in the morning, wherever he is, it's a billion light years away. <laughs> Not a billion light years away, because it hasn't been a billion years. It's a billion kilometers away. <laughs> And Ray wakes up and the instrument has this red flag that says something's been recorded. And he, he says, what the hell is this? And um, they spend the next several months analyzing the data. What it was, uh, was the collision of two black holes, um, which happened about one and a half billion years ago, plus or minus a couple hundred thousand million years. You know, our accuracy is not that good. Um, each one was about 30 times the mass of the sun. They had probably been in orbit together for a billion years, but we could not detect them. LIGO, which is the name of the instrument, picked up the final microseconds of their lives together before they collided and quieted down to one big black hole. I've I haven't slowed that down. This is a numerical simulation. We could not possibly in a million years resolve those images, but... Um, but we recorded something like seven orbits. So in other words, like imagine mallets going seven times and the ringing of the drum that you would hear from that. That single event, by the time it hit the Earth, moved the instruments by less than one ten thousandth of the nucleus of an atom over four kilometers. It's a stunning, experimental achievement, stunning. That's how quiet it was. Had I been looming by the black holes, they actually ring space-time in the human auditory range. It is not inconceivable that I would literally, even in the absence of air, have heard it with my ear mechanism. Okay, nobody's, I haven't asked anyone to study the anatomy accurately enough to make sure that that claim's exactly true, but it's plausible, okay. The beauty is that the instrument records over the range of the piano and in the human auditory range. This is what it sounded like. So imagine an electric guitar being plucked, that space time. They record it with this giant insane machine and they play it back in the control room and it sounds like this. Okay, it sounds like this. <laughs> I know, I know. I know. It's still really cool. 
It's still really cool. <laughs> so they spend several months analyzing the data before they're sure. By Boxing Day, um, the same year, they record another event. It's another big black hole with a smaller black hole. Again, this is a numerical simulation. Drastically slowed down because we couldn't possibly perceive it if it was at natural speed. This is something like 17 milliseconds. Notice how the event horizons themselves get distorted. Um, so, okay, 17 milliseconds. We're about to see it from a different angle. We're not really sure what angle it was at. The best we can do, if you ever like tried to find your phone when it's ringing, you don't have a great sense of direction. It's not like eyes. So this is similar. We can hear this ringing of the space time. It's washing over us. We're kind of like, it kind of came from the southern sky. That's kind of the best we can do. Here's a comparison of the two sounds, and I'm gonna play them to you because I want you to notice you can hear the difference. So that's Boxing Day. And that's the first observation. So they're increased in pitch and slowed down for our ear, but they're actually in the human auditory range. The point is, is that we can tell from that silly sound how big the black holes are, where they came from, um, how far away they were, if they're spinning. We can't tell all these things in equal measure, but we can tell a lot. And that's really quite spectacular. It's literally like listening to a drum and deducing the shape, size, and motion of the mallets. And that's the remarkable aspect of this experiment. So despite all odds, and despite, there were battles in Congress over this. There were many astronomers who said this experiment should not happen, it should not be refunded. And I don't know if they're right or wrong. It was a lot of money, right? But it was a pretty tremendous discovery. It was the first time we had ever discovered black holes that was direct. It wasn't by looking at other things around the black holes. And that was only a couple years ago. This um, is a numerical simulation of a recent observation that followed, which was the collision of two neutron stars. So neutron stars are dead stars. These are, this is the sound that they make when they collide. They are not quite big enough to become black holes, so they're dead stars, so they're real things. They're not places, they're actual objects. They're incredibly dense objects, and when they collide, they uh, create fireworks. And those fireworks, it was, Possibly, the, it wasn't even possibly, it was definitely the most observed event in the history of astronomy. Something like 25% of all astronomers in the world went like thwunk to look at this. And they looked at it in all kinds of light, all kinds of observations for a year. And it was absolutely stunning what uh, the correlation between what they saw and what they heard. And I can tell you that this is the only uh, way that we know of that the universe makes gold. So if you are wearing gold, or if you own gold, or you invest in gold, it was made in the collision of two neutron stars. And that's the only place that we know of where it's made. Um, so that brings us now to the first time we saw a black hole. And this is even more recent. This has been a century of black hole discoveries that has been quite remarkable. Um, here we are looking at the center of our galaxy. And again, these are real observations. And these very patient astronomers, some from Germany, some from the US, some from all over the world, looked at that black hole in the center of our galaxy that I told you was called Sagittarius A star, That's four million times the mass of the sun, and they saw stars orbiting nothing. And that's how they deduced that there was this black hole 26,000 light years away that was dominating the center of our galaxy that we orbit all, you know, very, very slowly, but we're orbiting. And they studied these stars and they realized, hey, these stars are orbiting this really tiny nothing. 
I have this really tiny, dark nothing, and they deduced that there was a black hole there. And then some people thought, well, maybe we could take a picture of this thing. How would you take a picture of it? Well, if there's some light around it, we would take a picture of the shadow. You can only take a picture of the shadow if there's some light around it. And so there was this project known as Event Horizon Telescope that went out to try to resolve something that's only, imagine the sun on the sky, 20 widths of the sun, but now push it 26,000 light years away. They likened it to trying to take a picture of a piece of fruit on the moon. Or as, um, or as the leader of the project said, it's equivalent to reading the date on a quarter in San Francisco from New York City. And if you don't know your US geography very well, let me try to find an equivalent. Um, reading a kroner, date on a kroner <laughs> um, from France, if you're in Copenhagen. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> um, very hard to resolve. And so what they did is they set up a network of telescopes around the entire globe. And over the course of a couple of years, they tried to create in a very sophisticated way, one single snapshot from all of these telescopes as though it was a one single telescope the size of the Earth. And they came back, some of you may have seen this. How many of you have seen this image? Okay, so some of you have seen this image. Um, this is the first ever human recorded image of a black hole. We all looked at it together, which I think is really spectacular. There was this moment when it was revealed. I went to the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. to see the big reveal. It was pretty obvious what it was going to look like. We all knew what it was going to look like. Okay. Um, so that wasn't the big thing. The big thing was to share in the moment. And there was this feeling of like an entire species looking together. A billion people looked together at that moment at this object looming above us, below us. It doesn't really meaningless to say where. Okay? And it is a black hole. It is not our black hole, though. It was not Sagittarius A star. The only surprise for me was the only other candidate that they had was a very big black hole. It's six and a half billion times the mass of the sun. It is in a galaxy known as M87. Uh, Messier was an astronomer who made a catalog, and this was the 87th object in his catalog. And it was a catalog of objects to ignore because they were not interesting. And that was fair, because at the time Messier was working, they were just smudges on the sky. He thought, eh, it's just a gas cloud. How would you know? It was a whole galaxy, and that it was just really far away, 55 million light years away. So that object, which is much bigger than our black hole, and much further away, is about the same size on the sky. And it's actually the one that they were able to map. And so this is what we call M87 star, the black hole in the center of the galaxy M87. It is absolutely colossal. And what you're seeing is just the light around it from hot debris and the shadow cast by that light. And if it wasn't for that light, you would see nothing. Right. So this has been a pretty exciting era. This is only 2019, right? This is amazingly recent. And so it's been a really exciting era for black holes. So just before I close, I, I just want to kind of emphasize, somebody asked me earlier, how important are black holes? I mean, they're fascinating and they're weird and they're interesting, but how important are they? We used to think they were not very important, but we're starting to understand that those supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies are actually sculpting the, the galaxies. They're actually creating situations in which it's possible for Earth to form. And that's because of the winds and the jets that they blow. And that means it's possible for human beings to evolve. And that means it's possible for human beings to ask the question about black holes and to discover them. And so they've kind of sculpted our past. And they're also probably our future. This is from the Hubble Space Telescope. These are all galaxies, um, real observations of galaxies. Because we're orbiting the supermassive black hole, if nothing else gets in the way, we will fall into that black hole. It's just very, very, very far future. As I like to say, the, the future is much longer than the past. So black holes are our past and they're probably our future. This is where 
all of our press releases and our hashtags and you know our you know our progeny and our excitement about the universe and our discoveries of black about black holes will end up in black holes <laughs> and they will never come out again <laughs> And so, to some extent, um, they are our future. And as I like to say in the Black Hole Survival Guide, um, there really is no surviving black holes. <laughs> so thank you so much, and we're going to do a Q&A. Thank you. <laughs>